Best friend told me he's in love with me two days before my wedding. Story time. I've been with my fiance for three years and we've been engaged for a little over a year. And me and my best friend will call him Steve for being friends since we were freshmen. So this morning, I woke up to a long ass message from Steve. The message was sent at like 6 a.m. this morning. And this text was him pouring his heart out to me. He said that he'd been in love with me for years and how he wished that I'd have broken it off with my fiance years ago. And that when I broke up with my fiance, I would realize that Steve was actually the man for me. He then asked me to call off my wedding and to run away with him. Steve, that's never gonna happen, babe. It's two days before my wedding. And he finished the text by saying, I needed to tell you before it was too late. I literally felt so gross when I received this text. I had never had any feelings for Steve other than just platonic friendship. So I kept drafting responses, but I just could not find the words to say. And at this point, I hadn't even told my fiance yet. I didn't want him worrying about me so close to the wedding because you know it's literally in like two days. I obviously know that I need to apply, but I just don't know what to say. What's worse is that he's kind of become my fiance's friend through it all as well. I'm gonna lie, I'm literally so pissed off that a friend has decided to cause me this much distress so close to my wedding. Well, literally so many times where Steve could have told me that he was in love with me that weren't two days, 48 hours before my wedding. Like babes, what do you want me to do? Cancel the wedding over goddamn text. Okay. So now I have the problem that he's actually invited to the wedding. And I obviously don't want him there because I'm not gonna lie, I just can't trust that he's not gonna pull something. I don't even know if I even wanna talk to him ever again, to be honest. But through it all, I'm not gonna lie, the thought of losing my best friend is actually heartbreaking. And then the thought of not having him at the wedding is even worse. I just feel like he's put me in this absolutely impossible situation. And I wish he'd not put me in the position where I'm now obviously responsible for his feelings. I don't want to kick him whilst he's down, but I obviously need to tell him that I'm not going to cancel the wedding and my wedding to my husband is still on. And also, I've just thought this, I'm so annoyed that he's had an alternative motive to our friendship this whole entire time. Like, we've been friends for 10 years. I did actually end up telling my now husband what Steve had said to me, so let me know if you want to hear that. So that night, my fiance got home from his brother's and I let him sit down and read the text. As he was reading them, his eyes were getting wider and wider and his expression was getting so angry. So of course, I started apologizing like an idiot, but he reassured me that I didn't owe him an apology for anything. We talked for a few hours about it and my fiance actually admitted that he'd always thought that Steve had a bit of a thing for me, but he didn't really mind too much because Steve had always kept it respectful. And he really was respectful, like besides a little side hug when we'd meet, etc., there was literally nothing that ever happened. I even let my husband read through a load of our old text so he could see that I hadn't been leading him on. I never even vented to Steve whenever me and my fiance would have an argument. I would always go to my mum because I knew better than that. So my fiance asked me what I wanted to do with the whole situation and I said that I knew that I didn't want him at the wedding so we decided to type up a text. The message was very brief but it said, Steve, I'm very sad that you took our friendship as something more. The wedding is going to happen and it'd be best if you didn't attend. To be clear, I let my fiance read the text and he is in agreement with me and stands by my decision to uninvite you from the wedding. We wanted to make it clear that it was me that had made the decision to uninvite him so he couldn't turn it around on my fiance. Because knowing him, he'd probably just say that it was my fiance that had forced me to uninvite him. He saw the message, but he left it on read for a few hours. Oh my God, I started to get so anxious about the fact that he wasn't replying. Part of me wanted to block him, but the other part of me just wanted to hear him out. So when Steve finally responded, the text was so long that I had to like click on it to read it. It was vile. He called me a liar and said that I'd been leading him on for decades. He said that he hopes my fiance ends up leaving me and that when we want to have children, we end up trouble getting pregnant. But I just kept crying. So my fiance took my phone into the other room and came back after about an hour. I still don't know what happened, but I assume that he must have called it. He told me that Steve was blocked on everything and that the maid of honor and best man were aware of the situation. So if he tried to turn up or anything kicked off, they were gonna deal with it. And to be honest, after reading Steve's message, I really wasn't that sad that he wouldn't be attending the wedding anymore. And just for the record, we had the best wedding day. My wife and I started playing hide and seek with our two young kids. However, they're a little too young to hide effectively. And they always hide in the same spot every time. So we found it's more fun for one of us parents to hide and then the rest of us seek. On Tuesday evening after work, we decided to play. My wife decided to hide first. I counted down from 10 with the kids holed up in the downstairs office. Ready or not, here I come. I saw her when I entered the living room. She was crouched behind the couch. I could see a bit of her elbow poking out from behind the upholstery. I waited for them to squeal in delight. Except they didn't. Confused, I approached the couch. It's a sofa. It's a fucking sofa. She wasn't there. Maybe I'd just seen a tag or something poking out. 
or maybe she'd moved her hiding spot. Wouldn't be the first time. Well. So we moved on. We checked all the usual spots underneath the shelving in the garage, behind the kitchen door. She wasn't in any of those spots. Maybe she went upstairs. I hadn't heard her go upstairs, but she can creep pretty quietly. Jessie, I called in a sing-song voice. We're gonna find you. Gotcha. Our bedroom door was open, and there was a long, Jess-shaped lump under the covers. Oh. Let's check Mum and Dad's bedroom, I said to the kids. Pattering footsteps charge behind me. I reached for the light switch, flicked on the lights, then grabbed the hem of the comforter and yanked it off. My heart dropped. The bed was empty. I stared down in confusion. It must have just been bunched up weirdly, but I could have sworn it looked like a person under there. The rough shape of someone in a fetal position, legs bent, back curved. I backed out of the room. The kids and I went downstairs. Jess, I called out. We can't find you. Come on out. Nothing. The kids lost interest. I was about to call out to her again when I noticed the chain of the basement door lock was disengaged. Aha. Uh -huh. As I approached, my heart hammered in my chest. I knew she was waiting on the other side, waiting to jump out at me and give me a heart attack. She'd done that before. I took a deep breath and swung open the door. She wasn't there. Damp air wafted up from the basement. I clicked on the light. Jess? I called out. No answer. The kids aren't playing anymore. I called down. And you shouldn't be hiding down there anyway. These stairs are too dangerous. <laughs> Nothing. I turned, about to close the door. But then something caught my eye. Black hair poking through the gap between the stairs. About halfway down. <laughs> She's hiding under the stairs. It's fucking great. I stepped down. The wood creaked under my weight. The hair glistened below me in the dim yellow light. I continued down the steps, avoiding stepping on her hair until I was standing on the concrete floor. I whirled around. Aha! But the space under the stairs was empty. My blood ran cold. Jess, this isn't funny, I shouted. Stop playing games with me. A footstep sounded behind me. I whirled round. The naked bulb in the ceiling only lit half the basement. The other half, where we had rows and rows of storage boxes, was in near total darkness. But I squinted, trying to make it out. In the murky darkness, behind a stack of boxes in the corner, I thought I could see her standing there. I could only see her in my peripheral vision, like how you see only dim stars when you're not looking right at them, because of how your optic cells are arranged. I focused on one of the storage boxes. I really stared at it. And when I did, I realised I could see her pale calves extending up into the darkness. As I stood there, I realised I could hear her breathing. I can see you there, I said, my voice wavering. Why are you being so weird? The kids aren't even playing anymore, so come out, please. Deep in the pit of my stomach, I knew there was something wrong. Something horribly wrong, so I chickened out. I'm going upstairs. You can join me when you're ready. I headed for the stairs, but halfway there, the bulb flickered. Total darkness surrounded me. I stretched my hands out, blindly groping into the darkness. They only fell on air. I frantically poured through the air, searching for something, anything. My fingers caught in something. Hair. I screamed and yanked my hands back. Then I ran blindly into the darkness, but something glanced off me. The side of the banister caught me straight in the chest. Panting, I felt my way to the stairs and climbed them as fast as I could. Then I locked my door to the basement and frantically ran to my kids. They were fine, but as I hugged them, I couldn't get the horrible thought out of my mind. The hair I'd felt, it was higher than my eye level. About six, six and a half feet off the ground. What's happening, please? What do you mean? Jess. Is only five foot two. Oh. It's a tall fucker. Uh, <laughs> the police searched the entire house. My wife isn't here. They searched the backyard and patrolled in a three mile radius. They came up empty handed. It's like she disappeared off the face of the earth. Except last night, as I rolled over in bed, I swear my fingers touched something. Apparently, I hard launched. My boyfriend on Instagram yesterday, so go look at my Instagram story if you want to see my new boyfriend. I'm fucking kidding. It's literally Tim. It's Tim's birthday, and I gave him, like, a birthday monumental moment on my Instagram story. And I had about a 
literally probably a hundred of you guys swipe up and be like, wait, is this your boyfriend? Like, like I'm so confused. Like, this is your boyfriend. There's a couple things wrong with that statement. Number one, Tim is gay. Tim is gay. He's my best friend. And like the real ones know Tim. Like the girls who know, know Tim. And second of all, if you think I'm the type of bitch who's gonna hard launch my boyfriend where for like a birthday shout out, you got the wrong fucking bitch. Probably will never hard launch a boyfriend in this lifetime, they have to be a fucking fiance, a ring on this goddamn finger if they want to be posted on my Instagram. Just because I'm a bitch, like, really no other reason. Like, why would I post you, you know? That's so rude, and I don't give a fuck. I will Alex Cooper everyone and be like, here's my fiance. Like, you're not getting boyfriend content. Well, like, I'll probably talk shit about him on the internet, but, like, that's about it. I get why people think Tim and I are dating. Since the moment Tim and I became friends, everyone has asked us if we are a couple. Like, even at restaurants, they're like, the lovely couple. And we look at each other disgusted because we're like, we both love men, unfortunately. But Tim is my soulmate. I went all out for his birthday today. I posted a lot of it on my Insta story, so go look at that. But I'm going to tell you guys some story time about Tim and I, because we have just like the wildest stories together. Tim is exactly like me in a different font. I always say Tim is more dramatic than me. You guys drag me in the comments being like, girl, no one's more dramatic than you. Fuck off. Fuck all the way off. This first story time is the $1,000 dinner Tim made me go to. Tim used to work at the super bougie restaurant. Like it's one of New York City's nicest restaurants and he would get 50% off. But like 50% off is still a lot of fucking money for a dinner. And he's like, we should go. And I'm like, yeah, for sure, let's go. He books us a reservation and I'm like, okay, perfect. Because right before this dinner, I get fired from the job I was working at. And I'm like, Tim, wait, hold the fuck up. Like I cannot do dinner. I literally just lost my job. There's no way I can spend a thousand dollars on like, and also like, I don't even think I had a thousand dollars to my name at that point. So I was like, okay, absolutely not. I can't do this. And he's like, Libby, we have to go. I can't cancel this reservation. And I'm like, Tim, I want to die right now. Like I want to die. And you're probably thinking like an a thousand dollar dinner. Are you guys insane? Yes. That's the problem. Like Tim and I are that insane where we're like, we just love bougie dinners. We're just very bougie people. And it's like too much for our own good, like too much for our own bank accounts kind of thing. Like nobody just does a thousand dollar dinners. And Tim and I are like, why would we not? Why would we not? Tim, you need to cancel. He's like, Libby, I can't. And everyone's like, Libby, you just like have to go. And I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna cry. At this point, I'm like mad at myself. I'm like, I'm not making good adult financial decisions. How the fuck did I let Tim talk me into a thousand dollar dinner? Like what? What am I doing? And But then on the other side, I'm like, girl, you only live once. Like, come on. Tim and I go to this $1,000 dinner. It is hands down the best dinner I've ever been to. Like, I wish I could come on here and be like, it was fucking ass. Like, why did I spend $1,000 at dinner? But like with his discount, it was still $300 a person. It was the best dinner I ever had. And you're probably like, Livy, no fucking duh. Like for that price, they should be eating your ass at dinner and calling you babe. Like the, for, literally for that price, it's so fucking expensive. Like, yeah, it should be the best dinner ever. This next story time is when him and I decided to do sober January. So like, I'm not that big of a drinker, but Tim is. Tim loves to fucking party. And that's what I love about Tim. Not really. I just fucking lied to you. Honestly, he kind of pisses. Every time he drinks, him and I fight a little bit and it's fine it's a part of our love we decided to do sober january because tim was like well will you do it with me i'm like yeah of course like why would i not do it i didn't realize how much i was gonna fucking hate it because i'm convinced there's nothing worse than being sober around drunk people like just drunk annoying fucking people and that's what we were doing during sober january tim was like let's do kava which i still really don't understand what kava is but basically it's just supposed to make you feel drunk but like you're not not actually drinking like so Tim and I are going to like the depths of Brooklyn to find these like kava places because we're doing sober January and we have a friend's birthday and we're like well we can't be sober the entire fucking night like let's just try kava we start drinking this kava and it tastes like asshole like it honestly tastes like ass and he's like just power through it Libby like just power through it. I'm like Tim I don't even feel like this is worth it for sober fucking January like this is horrible like the way it tasted was so disgusting then we get on the train ride to go to the club that we were going to for our friend's birthday and like we're feeling it we're like oh my god like i'm like i'm a little loopy like, ah. moment we get in to that said club for the birthday it wears off and both of us are dead fucking sober and we're just like uh, Tim, why the fuck didn't you tell me it wears off so quickly? He's like, why do you think I know all about kava? And I'm like, because you're the one that had me in the middle of fucking Brooklyn looking for kava. What do you mean? So we honestly just spent January miserable 
as shit a little bit because it's like I don't like to drink at all but once I'm like told that I can't do something I'm like why I need a fucking margarita now like it's just like not that fun we were just honestly so mean to each other each other during sober January and I think it was because we were just like not we we're just told not to drink but those are just a couple story times of Tim and I. Happy birthday, baby. I love you. I have a vlog coming up today. And go look at my Insta. My ex ruined his life and I'm buzzing about it. Story time. So I found out that my ex is having an affair. He told me that he'd found a woman at work and he'd fallen in love with her. He told me that he no longer loved me and that he wanted a divorce. And we had been together since we were in our teens. Bearing in mind, he'd known this woman for three months. And we had three children together as well. And I desperately fought for our marriage, but he simply just would not stop seeing this woman. This one weekend, he disappeared from Friday afternoon till Sunday night. And that was a final straw. So I was like, see ya. And I threw him out. And he immediately moved in with this other girl. The only excuse he ever gave me was that there was just something about this girl and he deserved to be happy. And that was it. That was the excuse for throwing literally everything away. We ended up finalizing the divorce in early 2022. So although I had some very strong feelings towards him, I faked it enough to get some pretty favorable divorce terms from him. Seeing that he was so intent on being with his dream girl super quick that he wasn't really intending on having a long divorce. In the end, I got to keep my house, which was good because I bought this from my grandma. I did have to give him quite a hefty payout though. And throughout all of it, the kids took it really, really hard. My eldest son told him that if he chose this other woman, then he would not have a relationship with this son anymore. But my daughter does have somewhat of a relationship. But their conversations end with my daughter being really upset most of the time. So about four months after the divorce goes through, my ex contacts me. He realized he'd made a horrible mistake and was asking if he could come home. So it turns out this dream woman was actually a really nasty piece of work and a not very nice person at all. So I used this opportunity to tell him exactly what I thought about him as a person. And whilst I was at it, I thought I might as well throw him what he was like as a father and as a partner. I told him that this is his life now. I told him that he no longer had a home at this house and to never even try contacting me ever again. So a few things have happened since that many's tried to contact me again. I'm also aware that this is not the right shade, but we'll sort it out. First of all, I met someone. My sister introduced me to someone who she works with who is also divorced. We got on so well and have been seeing each other since last summer. It's quite nice actually, because neither of us want to get married again. And secretly, I think he deserves all the pain he's going through in regards to the kids. He destroyed our whole family without so much of an afterthought. Well, too bad, hon. So sad for you. So, he recently ended up telling my daughter that he'd actually broken it up with his dream girl. I found out that the dream girl had nicked all of his money and that that money actually turned out to be mine. You know the money from the divorce settlement? Yeah. Oh, and she also wrote off his car when she was driving drunk, so that's great. And this is all coming from a woman in her 30s. You know, just to remind everyone, coming from a woman who he knew for three months and then proceeded to ruin our whole family for. And I act like I feel pretty sorry for him. Inside, I delight that this is the life that he's made for himself. Call me evil or whatever. He bought all of this on himself. So if you're watching this, enjoy your shite one bed apartment and your broken down car hunt. Oh, and me and my new partner will think of you when we're on our vacation in Hawaii. I know Hawaii was the place you always wanted to go. Maybe I'll send you a postcard. Am I the asshole for blowing up at my husband for sharing pics of our daughter's birthday celebration, resulting in my family finding out about it? Ever since my brother passed away at the age of 17 on his birthday, my family decided to never celebrate birthdays again. It was my mom and dad's decision, but because of how much the family loved my brother, extended family decided to do the same and stand in agreement with this decision. My husband would refuse to follow this decision and kept celebrating his birthday. Me and the family didn't say a thing about it since he's not blood family. But when I first got pregnant, the argument about celebrating our daughter's birthday occurred. My family advised me to just not celebrate her birthday since she's a baby and won't even remember anyways. I agreed, but my husband threw a fit and insisted that we celebrate our daughter's first birthday. I caved in eventually, but told him we'd have a small secret celebration so that my family wouldn't find out. He agreed. The next Next day, I got a call from my mom and she was so upset saying that my word meant nothing and that I have no respect for my brother's memory nor the family. I asked what she meant and she told me she saw the birthday party pics my husband posted on social media. I was too shocked to even argue. I hung up and went straight to my husband to confront him about it. He got defensive and said that he didn't need my permission to post pics and that he wanted to show his family the birthday celebration pics since I insisted we have 
a small secret party and exclude them. I explained to him how this made me look bad and a liar to my family, but he said they can get over it and called my mom snobby. <laughs> I blew up at him and we had a huge fight about it. He started sulking later and said I ruined the memory of our daughter's first birthday for him and verbally abused him with how I lashed out, but I solely did it out of frustration, knowing that what happened caused a massive problem between me and my family. Now he's expecting an apology from me. Am I the asshole? Am I in the wrong for giving my mum the wrong start time to my birthday so she would be on time? My mum is one of those people that will be late for literally everything. Birthdays, weddings, bar mitzvahs, christening, you name it, and my mum is turning up late. When I was younger, I used to think that she just had really poor time management skills. But now that I'm a bit older, I just think she likes the attention of making a bit of an entrance when you're late, you know? I personally find it, one, rude, and two, super embarrassing. It's not like it's happening like every once in a while. It is at every single occasion. So so many family members have complained about her, but literally nothing ever changes. It's now at the point where wherever my grandma has any like meals or lunches, she tells my mum an hour earlier so she'll actually turn up on time. My mum obviously has no idea that she's doing this. And it's actually become a little bit of a running joke between me and my grandma now. So this past weekend was my 22nd birthday. And my grandma wanted to do me a little lunch at her place with me and obviously my immediate family. Lunch started at two, so of course we told my mum it started at one. And that night I was going for dinner with my boyfriend, so I needed to leave my grandma's house at about five o'clock. So of course my mum was late. We called her at 2.30 to find out where she was. Cause you know, like it's your daughter's birthday. And at 2.30, she had only just left her house. And even then she had to go pick up her boyfriend before getting to my grandma's house. And she lives like 30 to 40 minutes away. So none of us are really expecting her to get there to like half past three at the latest. This woman then arrives two and a half hours later than the time that we originally told her. So we question her on it and we're like, hi, um, why are you so late? And she stops acting all confused and she's like, but I thought it started at two. We then asked her where she'd heard this from because obviously we all told her two and she said it was my aunt who was present at the dinner. So we questioned my aunt and she said that she felt bad that we were all lying to my mom. So everyone gets pretty annoyed, but we all move on. So fast forward, it gets to the point where I start having to get ready to go. And my mom starts getting all annoyed at me for leaving so soon. And she went on to say how she'd barely got to see me on my birthday. So I got really annoyed and was like, babes, my life does not revolve around you and you should have been here sooner. My own mum then started to give me a little bit of an attitude and was listing all of these excuses as to why she was late. I just couldn't be bothered to hear the excuses, so I ended up leaving. Late that night, she messaged me and said that I was acting like an arsehole towards her and that I was so, so wrong for lying to her. My mum and aunt have now caused this big old drama about it all. My grandma literally couldn't give two hoots about it and she thinks that I'm in the right here. She says they're just being immature and dramatic. So what do you think? Okay, I just witnessed something that just perfectly encompasses what it's like to work in customer service for those of you who never have. So I'm at this restaurant, the table next to me is getting ready to order desserts. So the server's at the table and she's like, hey, were y'all looking to get any desserts today? The woman at the table says, I was actually in here yesterday and I had your chocolate dessert and I really liked it. And the server's like, oh, great, which one did you have? I guess she's trying to be personable, like just conversation. And the woman says, which one? I thought, I didn't know there was more than one chocolate one. The server says, yeah, we have this chocolate one that's just all chocolate, and then we have this one that's chocolate and peanut butter. She gave more lengthy explanations, but just for the sake of the video, she's like, chocolate or chocolate and peanut butter. And the woman says, oh, well, the one I had yesterday didn't have any peanut butter on it. And the server says, okay, so you, you just had our chocolate one. Would you like that one again? <laughs> the customer says, well, wait a minute, what's the difference between, between the two chocolate ones? The server's like, oh, one's chocolate, one's chocolate and peanut butter. That's basically the difference. Again, the woman says, well, yesterday mine didn't have any peanut butter on it. The server says, okay, so you just had our chocolate one. Would you like to try that one again? And the server, <laughs> this woman says, but wait a minute, you have more than one chocolate one? What's the difference? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get the difference. And the server, you know, tight lip smile. Well, one is just chocolate. Just chocolate. I think that's the one that you had and liked it. We have another one that is chocolate as well, but it also has peanut butter. Those are our chocolate desserts. Do you know which one you would like? And the one says, well, mine yesterday didn't have any peanut butter on it. And the server literally just like puts her hands down and just like looks up like, okay, that's great. And you liked that one, right? Did you want to do that one again? And the woman's like, 
Well, wait a minute, you have more than one chocolate dessert, don't you? And the server says, yes. We have a chocolate one that you had, and then we have a peanut butter one with chocolate. Do you want that one? And the woman says, well, I'm not really sure. Can you explain it? And the server's just like, I'm gonna grab a menu for you. And she finally just leaves. And and the real bullshit about it all, the real bullshit, like after this woman made that server go through that insanity inducing conversation, after she walked away, the customer was like looking after the server, like just scoffed, like the audacity. She couldn't answer my question. She just, I didn't ask for a menu. I hate people. I tell people here in the US that I speak Spanish fluently. One of the questions I get asked usually is if I ever catch people talking about me in public. And while this hasn't happened very many times, when it does happen, whoo, it is literally one of my favorite things. I used to experience this a lot more when I was teaching English in Spain because my students just assumed because I was American, I had no ability to speak a second language, which fair, the stereotype is low-key a little bit true but here in the u.s something happened to me recently that really caught me off guard because it's been a long time since this has happened to me that i was shopping in a store with my mom and for context my mom is huelita gringuita giri como yo blonde typical american stereotype the whole nine yards we were at a store and she was trying to buy this like furniture piece but the furniture was broken and because it was the last one she decided she still wanted to buy it and she was asking the cashier for a discount and like in a super nice way mind you just explaining like hey this thing is broken would it be possible to get a discount if not totally fine and this worker turned to another worker and started talking about my mom in spanish saying basically that she was like cheap and why is she asking for a discount and she's been so lazy and all these things and i was literally sitting there like what do i do right now and like listen you can talk about me but you want to talk about my mom mm, 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 mm. so i waited i let them talk their shit their little cheeks man right in front of me and when they were done i just looked at them and i said this is about the see abajo see ¿Ves que está un poquito roto ahí? Sí. Como es el último, queremos comprarlo, pero si no es posible un descuento, sí está bien. O sea, podemos irnos sin comprar nada. To say the least, we got that discount. So all I'm saying, you never know when that secret weapon's gonna come out, okay? Be careful who you talk about in public. I work at this call center that was open 365 days a year, and every year I signed up to work the holiday shift. Those are my favorite shifts to work because you got time and a half. Plus, it's kind of the wild west. There were never any supervisors working. I mean, why would a manager want to work on a holiday, right? But anyways, this one year I was working on Christmas Day, and although we were technically supposed to be open 24-7, on Christmas Eve, the last person actually got finished at about 2 a.m., and my shift didn't start until 6, so there was around four hours where no one was working the queues. Now, if you're the caller, you obviously don't know that. You just hear a robot voice saying, there is one caller in line ahead of you. But if you're the representative, you can see all the people who have called in as well as how long they've been waiting for and when someone's been on hold for a really long time that person's name will like light up in red and blink freakily at you and i would imagine some mba grad who's probably besties with kendall roy and has never worked a phone line a day in his life invented this feature for productivity reasons but anyways i digress it's christmas morning i log in i'm the only one at the company who's working and when i get there i see a blinking red light inducing anxiety and that the person has been waiting on hold for about three hours so we're already off to a great start i pick up the phone Thank you for your patience, this is Marissa, how can I help you? Immediately, all I hear is like a blood, ah, like blood curdling scream, you know? And I'm like, are you okay? Can I help you? Scream stops, tone shift. She's like, yes, I'm okay, just sick of waiting. <laughs> so for a second, I thought she misdialed 911, but all right, at least she's okay. I'm sorry for the wait, ma'am, how can I help you? She asked me if I drink diet soda, <laughs> uh, told me that it rots my teeth, rots my brain, causes cancer, according to this lady. And I say, duly noted, I didn't know that. Thank you so much, how can I help you today? And she proceeds to tell me about a hobby she's picked up. She had recently started to do jam making, like homemade jam making. She tells me about the weather in California um, and also this Australian Pink Floyd cover band. Apparently they're quite good. She's never actually seen them live, but she recommended I check them out if they were ever in my area. Anyways, I again, try to proceed with the conversation and ask if there's anything I'd help with. And she says, as a matter of fact, yes. She was trying to make one of those like Christmas fruit cakes, but was having trouble caramelizing the ginger. Could I help her with this? Uh, now this call center was ticket sales, like concerts, theater, event, 
to get stuff. Uh, not recipe support, but she sounded pretty distraught and hey, you know, Google's free. So I do a little digging and I pull up a YouTube video and I narrate it over the phone to her, um, walking her through over about two hours on the phone, listening to her life story intermittently, um, how to caramelize ginger. Turns out you just boil water, chuck the ginger in there, add some sugar and uh, lemon juice. Um, and she had like vanilla pods. So we threw those in there as well. Um, anyways, I really hope she's doing well and that she finally got to see Aussie Floyd live. I hear they are amazing. <laughs>